Hello and welcome back to CS615 System Administration. This is week 2, segment 2, and after we covered conceptual storage models in a previous video, we'll next be talking briefly about storage devices and interfaces. As usual, this is merely scratching the surface on a much larger topic, but I hope you get a bit of a taste of the many layers and concepts involved as we talk about storage media. Let's begin with SCSI, one of the older standards describing how to connect devices or peripherals to computers and transferring data between them. The Small Computer System Interface has been around for over 30 years and exists in a confusing number of implementations and variations. SCSI used to be the default method to connect any peripheral device using long, wide, and generally unwieldy ribbon cables and different types of connectors. Here's a SCSI drive. But different devices may use different connectors and require different cables. SCSI has now largely been obsoleted by the Advanced Technology Attachment or ATA standards, but still lives on in the iSCSI standard, specifying storage connections using the SCSI command protocol over IP-based networks, a common choice in storage area networks. Another variation we'll see in a few minutes is the modern Serial Attached SCSI SAS, or SCSI over Fiber Channel protocol. The ATA standard, on the other hand, is often equated with the Integrated Device Electronics Interface, or IDE. You may have seen parallel ATA using flat, wide ribbon cables that make it impossible to wire multiple drives inside a server case, although nowadays, fortunately for sysadmins in their hands, serial ATA, or SATA, is more common. These are your typical hard drives, which are named Integrated Device Electronics because the drive includes the controller, integrating some of the complexity carried on the motherboard and separate controller and SCSI. That is, the drive includes a controller circuit as well as a few bits of firmware to facilitate the access. Now, we're talking about a fairly low-level connection here, but now is as good a time as any to remind you that security affects everything. A few years ago, it became public that the NSA was capable of implanting malware in the firmware of hard drives, which included an API and the ability to read-write arbitrary information into hidden sectors on the disk. This is a really difficult threat to protect against, and a good reminder of the fact that just about anything can be compromised. Specifically, it helps us consider that words have meaning, and that the name Integrated Device Electronics implies that there is not just a bit of rather helpful magic sitting there. But don't fret, not every hard drive is necessarily compromised and you are not necessarily likely to be on the target list of the NSA. However, for several reasons, including security, but more likely performance, you may wish to move away from IDE drives, perhaps towards solid-state drives, or SSDs. An SSD drive puts away with having mechanical rotating magnetic platters on which to store data, and instead uses integrated circuits to store data persistently, such as flash memory. These drives are significantly more resistant to physical shock, more silent, and have less latency than IDE drives, which is why your cell phone most likely uses SSD for storage. While still more expensive than traditional mechanical hard drives, you nowadays find more SDD or flash memory in use even in the server market. These will still use the SATA standard to connect, but may also be combined into larger storage devices, which then might be connected externally or over a storage area network using, for example, the fiber channel protocol. Fiber channel is usually used in a switched fabric, meaning it looks and behaves a whole lot like your normal switched Ethernet network, and utilizes optical fiber cables, shown here on the top right, although you can also run it over copper wires. Now, if all these different technologies are not enough for you, you also want to consider that in just about any but the most simple environments, all of these are combined in some form when storage area networks are created. That is, you will likely find a multi-layered stack of protocols, building on top of the fiber channel protocol, which might be utilized in a pure optical fiber channel network, an Ethernet network on top of regular TCP IP, and so on. Similarly, the SCSI protocol may be used on top of either one of those, or over something like remote direct memory access over, say, InfiniBand. That is, we have all sorts of means to piggyback storage protocols on top of other protocols. ATA over Ethernet, for example, allows us to reuse our existing Ethernet network and turn it into a storage area network by encapsulating ATA frames into Ethernet frames. Fiber channel over Ethernet is the same, but for the fiber channel protocol, 
and thus gives you an idea, a trend whereby folks realize that, hey, we already have a working network here, let's just make it carry block level instructions as well. So you really get anything over Ethernet, which makes things quite easy, but also notably implies that the storage area network you build in this way is restricted to the same layer 2 network segment, and as it runs on that layer, has no inherent security properties. So you can then try to push things up the stack by using, for example, iSCSI, which includes authentication and can be wrapped in IPsec, for example. And of course, we can take it up a notch and move on to serial attached SCSI, which we mentioned earlier, and which nowadays is used in huge storage arrays, such as this one, offering efficient high-speed storage access using the SCSI commands and protocol on modern hardware. But true to its SCSI heritage, SAS, of course, also suffers from no shortage of confusing variations and connectors. As you can tell, the opportunities to broaden your understanding or to specialize in storage technologies and protocols are not limited in any way. As a quick look at how technologies have advanced, note how performance throughput has increased over time and by protocol. You see all the technologies we mentioned so far in the scroll increasing bit rates over time. Noting the introduction of fiber channel with around 100 megabyte per second, and then moving forward with the various over ethernet variations. Now going over gigabit ethernet and eventually over 100 gig ethernet, which is really pretty slick. So this addresses the bit range for throughput. But just how many bytes can we store on the different media? Well, the individual IDE drive has come a long way from the roughly 5 megabyte drive costing around $1,500 in 1980, hasn't it? I remember well when we built servers with 500 megabyte drives and when eventually a 10 gigabyte drive was considered huge, but of course, nowadays, that's nothing. In fact, the price of storage for IDE drives has gone down so much that you can now buy an 18 terabyte drive for just about $600. 18 terabyte in a single IDE drive, that's just amazing. So yeah, in a way, upgrading your individual disk drive is an example of scaling vertically, as we discussed in the previous video. But even if 18 terabyte is not enough for you, because, as we established, disk usage expands to fill all available space, you can consider just getting a whole bunch of them and hooking them up one by one. That would be a disk configuration commonly referred to as a JBOD, just a bunch of disks, which is exactly what it sounds like. You'd buy a bunch of drives, and there you go. Now there's a fair bit of overhead on your server, because you have 15 individual disks, but it's certainly an approach that might represent horizontal scaling, with all its implied drawbacks. Or perhaps a better approach might be to take all of these beefy access drives and put them into a RAID controller to then combine them into a single volume, in effect combining the vertical and the horizontal scaling approaches. We'll talk a bit more about RAID in our next video, but of course nothing requires us to use IDE drives for this approach. We could instead use SSDs, right? Like this one. This is a 100 terabyte solid state drive. 100 terabyte in a tiny 3.5 inch form factor. Only problem? This will cost you a cool $40,000. Yep, you heard that right, $40,000 for a 100 terabyte STD. Well, STDs are more expensive, but they also are a lot faster and reliable than HDDs. So talk about scaling vertically here. And now imagine scaling that horizontally as well into a storage appliance that combines SDDs or flash memory like this NetApp all flash arrays shown here. Again, as you can see, there are countless ways to combine things to provide you with the right solution for your storage needs, with each carrying its own advantages or disadvantages. And so there's no single simple solution to say, you should buy X or you should use Y. What the right solution is, depends on your specific requirements as well as, as we've just seen, your budget. Sky's the limit. Okay, I think we're going to take a quick break here. Next time we're going to be talking a bit more about RAID and logical volume management, as well as the physical aspects of a typical HDD. But before we go there, I'd like to leave you again with another exercise. 
Let's pretend you're a sysadmin and working at Stevens, and you have to replace the current storage system we use for the home directories on Linux lab. What solution would you propose? Now, obviously you're lacking a lot of information to make this call, but on the other hand, you can probably make an educated guess on the storage needs, based on the observed usage. Try to spec a solution and then see how much that will cost you. Then consider that as an academic institution, you are likely bound by a budget with certain limitations. Finally, consider what implications your choice might have on the rest of the compute environment. Okay, I think this should keep you busy until the next video. See you then. Cheers.